This is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I'm your host, Davey Crockett. Thanks. Thanks for coming. This is episode 63, the 10th part of the history of the 100 miler. In this episode, I will tell the story of a historic international 100 mile race held in England in 1969 when three ultra running titans battled to break the world record. During the late 1960s, 100 mile races started to make a comeback both in England and in the United States. Walking 100 miles in under 24 hours became popular in Europe, and similar events also started to be held in America, featuring a legendary lumberjack walker from Montana. Racing 100 miles also rose from the ashes. A long-forgotten indoor 24-hour race started up in Los Angeles, California, where Western ultra runners strive to reach 100 miles on a tiny track up seven stories in the busy downtown metropolis. But the most significant 100-mile race of the decade was held in 1969 at Walton-on-Thames in Surrey, England. The race featured many of the greatest ultra runners of the world at the time who were interested in trying to run 100 miles. It was a fitting way to finish out the 1960s, and news of the event would help spawn many other 100 milers in the 1970s. In America, it reopened the sport to distances longer than 50 miles. In England during the 1960s, popularity for walking 100 miles using race walking rules grew and 145 walkers became British centurions for the first time. In 1911, the Surrey Walking Club established the Brotherhood of Centurions to honor those who walked 100 miles in 24 hours or less. See episode 58. Many walkers from the Netherlands started to participate as the 1960s walking craze spread across Europe. The Dutch founded their own centurion club in 1966. Larry O'Neill of Kalispell, Montana was a lumber industry executive or lumberjack. I'm a lumberjack and I'm okay. I sleep all night and I work all day. He's a lumberjack and he's okay. He sleeps all night and he works all day. With his arduous outdoor life in Montana, he stayed very physically fit. In 1964, he attended a national AAU meet held in Kalispell. It included a 3,000-meter walking race. O'Neill came to watch. He explained, I looked at the track and field program and saw this 3,000-meter walking event. I didn't know what it was, but I figured it would be the easiest event of the meet. After that time, there was an announcement over the loudspeaker that two walkers had dropped out. Walkers were recruited from the stands, and O'Neill, age 57, hustled over to enter on a dare. He did well, finishing fourth out of ten walkers. O'Neill discovered that walking long distances were his forte, and started seriously competing in 12 AAU events during the next couple years. In 1967, O'Neill received word that a national 100-mile walking championship would be held in Columbia, Missouri. The event would be held on a high school track. O'Neill said, I figured they were handing out six trophies, so I could probably take sixth. I just wanted to see if I could do it, go 100 miles. I was cornered. I had been telling my friends I could do better in these walking races if they were a little longer. I had no excuse this time. O'Neill, age 60, drove down from Montana and competed against four much younger walkers. The race was held on September 23, 1967. O'Neill's strategy was to stay with a race favorite as long as he could. The two began walking neck and neck. O'Neill said, I figured he was trying to pull me out too fast, so I slowed down and he built up a mile and a half lead in the first eight miles. I gradually cut into it until he took a stimulant. He took stimulants twice. When they wore off, I gradually made up the lead. I didn't take a lead of any consequence until about 25 miles. Once in the lead, the attention from spectators turned to him. High school coaches, college coaches, everyone along the sidelines were yelling that I was going too fast. Not knowing if I was, that was the mental strain. 
When you've got hundreds of laps to go, each lap rolls off awfully slow. Walk it out slow! Walk it out slow! Soon I began to start lapping the favorite, and eventually he dropped out of the race at mile 64. It gave me the impetus to see the great one out of the race. O'Neill surprised everyone and won with a time of 19 hours 24 minutes. He finished his last lap faster than his first. He established a modern era American 100 mile walking record. His record was held for 11 years. A few days later, O'Neill with sore feet proclaimed, That was the last one I'm going to be in. Following the British tradition, the Columbia Walking Club established the American Centurion Club with O'Neill as its first member. In 1968, he repeated his win with a time of 20 hours 51 minutes against 11 starters. In following years, he continued to dominate. The last of his seven career 100-mile finishes was accomplished in 1977 at the age of 70 with a time of 21 hours 55 minutes, and he became only the second person in the world to complete a 100-mile walking event over the age of 70. O'Neill never retired from walking. Later that year, he even went to Europe and competed in Sweden. He said, I would still like to have one perfect race when I knew I couldn't do any better. In my last race, I didn't go nearly as fast as my capacity. I wasn't even tired after 22 hours, although my heels were in terrific pain. Asked when he would quit, O'Neill replied, As I realize now, I should or could have been a better athlete as a kid. I guess I never excelled at any sport before race walking, so why should I quit when I've become good at something? Sadly, Larry O'Neill came down with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, and died at his home on September 14, 1981, at the age of 73. Will you tell me something, Mr. Lumberjack? Is it one for forward and three for back? Is it two for stop or four for go? I don't know. The Los Angeles Athletic Club, or LAAC, was established in 1880. In 1912, the club's new home was established downtown in a 12-story building. In the early 1960s, the downtown club was modernized with an indoor 165-yard rubber tartan track that was built on the seventh floor. The indoor track would be the site of 1960s American ultra-running history. In 1965, Steve Seymour, an Olympic athlete in the javelin throw, established the first modern-era 24-hour race in America, held indoors on the LAAC track. It was called the 24-hour last day run, and was held on Halloween. See episode 6. Why was it held on Halloween, and why was it called the last day run? The event was called The Last Day because it was associated with an annual 30-day jog competition that originated in California. This statewide competition was established in 1964 by the Olympic Club of San Francisco. Runners would run for 30 days in October. The club would award trophies to the running club with the highest total mileage during the month. Seymour decided to create the 1965 Last Day Run to help the club competitors pile up miles on the last day of October. In America's first modern era 24-hour race, Seymour won with 50 miles. Lou Dosti was an aerospace engineer and in his youth an Albanian soccer player. In 1968, he was a serious chain smoker, enjoying a sedentary life as a student, husband, father, and businessman. He would sit back and chuckle at the joggers on the track at the Los Angeles Athletic Club, where his daughter would swim and his wife worked out. He was warned by his doctor to lose weight and stop smoking, so he did. In October 1968, Dosti naively decided to participate in the month-long jogging event. Bud Murphy was a 41-year-old advertising executive and a longtime amateur athlete. Dosti's wife wrote that Murphy was, quote, pretty, a strapping six-foot-plus strawberry blonde baby blue-eyed Peter O'Toole. <laughs> In contrast, she described her husband, Lou, as a five-foot-nine, thinning-down-all-the-time Omar Sharif. <laughs> 
Previously, at the 1967 last day run, Murphy reached 100 miles in less than 24 hours. He was determined to defend his championship and run 100 miles faster in 1968. The 1968 last day run turned out to be a duel between Dosti and Murphy. Dosti was a rookie on nutrition and ate only one significant meal during the run, ending up losing 20 pounds. He was surprisingly in the lead at 67 miles. More experienced Murphy soon took over the lead and went 10 miles ahead of Dosti when he reached 90 miles. Dosti didn't sleep at all and developed tendonitis in both feet. At one point he said, I quit. But his coach and race director, Steve Seymour, pushed him back on the track. At the same time, Murphy had stomach problems and kept throwing up. He also returned to the track, quote, running like a gazelle. Murphy reached 100 miles in 21 hours, 36 minutes, breaking his 100 mile best and then quit. Dosti ran 93 miles, but achieved his goal as the club's overall month winner with 792 miles. 57 more than Murphy. With each additional year, the focus of the last day run evolved into a quest to reach 100 miles and played an important role on the West Coast to bring back the American 100 miler. In 1968, an invitational 100 mile track race was announced at Walton on Thames in England. Among the runners were three historically important ultra-running legends. Dave Box was from England. At age 19, in 1958, he moved to the British colony of Rhodesia, Africa, because he said it was warm there. Because of political conflicts, he then went to Durban, South Africa, where at age 36, in 1965, he took up running. He would soon join the long line of accomplished 100-mile runners from South Africa. Box had a focused goal of winning the Comrades Marathon, 54 miles. To remind him, he put up a plaque in his bedroom that read, Win the Comrades. He ran it for the first time in 1965 and placed 41st. His experience and training increased and he finished 7th in 1966 and 5th in 1968. It was written of Box, in his youth, he'd been a bodybuilder and built up his chest from 38 to 44 inches. It was said that he could pick up a penny in the hard clench of his pectorals. Box was a strutting pit bull of a man, with a boxer's nose and a short, immensely powerful frame that brooked no arguments. In 1968, Box went after the 100-mile world record on a track in Durban, South Africa. At least seven runners competed in the race. Box ran extremely well and claimed the world record by 6 minutes, finishing in 12 hours 40 minutes. But because of a timing recording issue, lap times not recorded, just counted, it was not recognized in England. In 1969 he headed to England in September to compete on the world stage at London to Brighton, where he finished 5th. He then prepared for the historic Walton-on-Thames 100-mile track race. John Tarrant was born in London, England. In 1950, at the age of 18, he took up boxing and earned 17 pounds on prize fights at a local town hall. When he discovered that he had talents running, he dreamed of running the marathon in the Olympics and gave up boxing. But he needed to join the Amateur Athletic Association of England, or AAA. In 1952, when he tried to register with the organization, he answered honestly that he had a brief career prize fighting. The AAU officials despised boxing and unfairly banned him from amateur running competition for life. But Tarrant wanted to run and compete. He continued to train in Derbyshire Hills, getting faster and stronger. In 1956 at Liverpool, he went unannounced to a 20-mile race with international distance runners. He joined the starters wearing a shirt without a number and raced. He dominated. No one could come close to him. A news reporter wrote about him and gave him the name of the Ghost Runner. No, he wasn't a spirit. He was running what we now call Bandit. 
Tarrant said, I ran to convince the AAA that I am purely amateur and raced for the love of it. I needed to show I had the ability. For the next two years, he gate-crashed several races and frequently won. In 1958, he applied for a reinstatement as an amateur. He received strong national sympathy. Harold Abrams, depicted in Chariots of Fire, was supportive, pointing out that in Terence's teen years he never had boxed with the Professional Boxing Association. In May 1958, Tarrant received wonderful news that he had been reinstated. He soon ran in his first official marathon and finished fourth. But clearly Tarrant had rankled the old running establishment, and when he intended to run internationally for Britain, he received a letter from the AAA that stated, quote, No one who is a reinstated professional may take part in international athletic competition. Tarrant was greatly disappointed. His Olympic marathon dreams were dashed away, and he wrote, Due to my honesty, I have lost the best athletic years of my life, and now faced with the prospect of not realizing my true potential. Society often gave murderers a second chance, but for 17 miserable pound notes, I was condemned for life. In 1965, he turned his attention to ultra-running, breaking course records, and setting a 40-mile world record in 1966 of 4 hours and 3 minutes in Wales. In 1967, he became the first man ever to win the Grand Slam of Britain's four principal ultramarathons, London to Brighton, 52 miles, Isle of Man, 39 miles, Exeter to Plymouth, 44 miles, and Liverpool to Blackpool, 48 miles. He won London to Brighton again in 1968. Tarrant's goal was almost in sight. That very welcome winning post was looming on the horizon. After five hours, 37 and a half minutes, he crossed the line for a winner's welcome from the Mayor of Brighton. In 1969, Tarrant went to South Africa to perhaps live permanently. He developed a friendship with rival Dave Box and lived with the Box family. Tarrant ran Comrades Bandit because South African officials unfortunately recognized his international ban. They even warned the other 800 runners not to run near him or they could have action take it against them. Tarrant had a disappointing race with terrible stomach issues and finished in a distant 28th place. In the fall of 1969, Tarrant decided to return home to England. He set his sights on breaking the 100-mile world record at Walton-on-Thames. No record intrigued him more. He started training about 40 to 50 miles per day. Ted Corbett was born in South Carolina. He became universally known as the father of American ultra-running, both as a competitor and as an administrator. He played basketball in high school, trained for cross-country, but his school did not have a team. He ran track running the 880-yard distance and had a mile time of less than five minutes. In 1936, at the age of 17, he heard about the marathon and for the first time realized that people ran that far. Corbett went to college at the University of Cincinnati and started to run longer distances on the track team but was prevented from competing in many meets because of his race. Moving to New York City, Corbett joined the New York Pioneer Club in 1947, which was an integrated running organization. He trained for a year before running his first marathon in 1951. Among those earliest road racers was Ted Corbett. Ted's training regimens were legendary. Living in Riverdale, he would run to and from his work in downtown Manhattan. He raced well enough after his very first marathon to make the 1952 Olympic marathon team that went to Helsinki. In 1958, Ted became the first president of the New York Roadrunners Club, which grew to be a world-respected organization. He became interested in running ultra distances and coined the term ultramarathon. We set up a program in 1958, our first uh, races, putting on races, and they ranged from uh, short road races up through 30 miles. We had a 30 mile uh, race uh, even in 1959. He became the second American to run London to Brighton, and in 1962 he finished fourth, 
setting a new record for the fastest newcomer. Corbett wanted to see more Americans compete on the world ultra-running stage at London to Brighton, so he continued to organize ultras in New York City, geared toward getting runners ready to compete in London. In 1969, at the age of 50, Ted was invited to compete in the 100-mile race at Walton-on-Thames in England. He trained hard for the race and even did a 100-mile training run to convince himself that he could go that distance. The 1969 Invitational 100-mile race was organized at Walton-on-Thames in England. The focus was to break the recognized 100-mile world record that stood at 12 hours, 46 minutes, 34 seconds, held by Wally Hayward of South Africa. The three titans, Box, Tarrant, and Corbett, were invited and traveled to England. Of the three, only Box had ever raced 100 miles before. During the few weeks leading up to the historic race, Box joined Tarrant at his Hereford apartment and they trained together. Box recalled, One day I tripped on a curb and tore my thigh muscles. Don took me to the football monsieur in Hereford and she was an absolute butcher. And I said it was making it worse, not better. So I took a few days off. Corbett made the National Hotel in central London his training camp headquarters. To concentrate on his 100-mile training, he avoided people. But being alone aggravated a depression issue. To help, he went sightseeing. It was reported, With three days to go, the reality of the 100 brought back all the depression and negative thoughts. He became so homesick for his family that he was seriously tempted to take the next plane home. But he stuck it out and ran a 45-mile park-hopping training run. As the day of the race approached, Tarrant did not show his usual jitters, but instead exhibited intense calm. He felt confident that he would do well. His extended family traveled down from Buxton to be there to support him. His brother Victor, who always crewed him, was to be at his side. Corbett dreamed the night before the race that he had broken his leg. Tarrant spent most of the day before the midnight start sleeping and then took a train with his wife to the venue. There were 25 timekeepers involved to support the 16 starters who would run on a dismal stop on lane track at Walton-on-Thames. A special tent was raised in the infield filled with the timers. A total of 60 officials outnumbered the runners four to one. Washing down thick jam sandwiches with honey sweetened tea, Terrence still harbored no doubts. As the flashlight sprang on the 440 yards of cinder, every one of his fellow athletes could sense the change in him. He had a lot more people surrounding him, and he seemed to have a premonition that he would win. Tarrant arrived at 10 p.m. Corbett soon also arrived and in the dressing room felt the tension and thought the runners all looked frightened. Ireland's Noel Henry said, I've looked forward to this race for two years and now I don't want to run it. Corbett saw Box and Tarrant restlessly awaiting the gun and realized he would just be satisfied to finish and break the American record of 16 hours, 7 minutes. The sky was clouded, the moon struggled through, the gun rang out. They were off on their fantasy journey. Gordon Bentley of the Tipton Harriers moved directly into the lead unchallenged with a seven minute mile pace. The rest quickly broke up into several bunches. You got me going in circles. Tarrant's plan was to run each lap at 1 minute, 45 seconds, regardless of what was happening around him. But after a few miles, he increased his speed and tried to gain on Bentley. Box, running with Corbett, shouted as Tarrant lapped them the second time, saying, You're going to be sorry later, John. Bentley increased his lead. Other runners started dropping out as early as 15 miles. Bentley passed 20 miles in 216 but by 50k he slowly faded and Tarrant took the lead by mile 40. Box panicked seeing Tarrant go and he tried to catch the ghost. As Box tried to unlap himself, the pace went wild. Corbett recalled, 
The intermediate sprint duel was unbelievable. Box determined to pass, and Tarrant was determined to not permit it. And with all those miles left. Then, without a warning, Tarrant stopped and puked his guts out for at least a half minute. He thought he was done, but soon got back into the race. The struggle between the two friends calmed down as Box, perhaps unwisely, let Tarrant recover. Corbett watched it all and just ran steadily. For fuel, Tarrant had been drinking a honey and tea mixture with glucose. He ate candy bars, sandwiches, biscuits, and drank a half cup of water every few laps. But after his puking episode, he stayed with orange juice and glucose. Corbett fueled on apricot nectar, tiger's milk, and a form of an energy bar. Box stuffed his mouth with food and drink every lap and was very talkative with other runners. The miles ticked off and four other runners dropped out by 35 miles. Tarrant stretched his lead to two minutes as Box kept putting on occasional charges. At mile 50, Box finally took the lead for the first time with a time of 5 hours 58 minutes. Tarrant was struggling and looked beaten. Corbett reached 50 miles 15 minutes later, feeling good, hoping that Tarrant and Box would annihilate each other. Others dropped out, and only nine continued. Box soon had a four-lap lead, and Tarrant felt that his chances for victory were gone. He just couldn't increase his pace, even with his son shouting loudly at him. Approaching mile 60, the sun rose into a beautiful morning, dispelling the discouragement of the night, and brought out fans to cheer the survivors. The daylight put energy in Tarrant, and he found his speed again and started gaining on Box. Tarrant's brother, Victor, shouted, If you keep this up, you can break the UK record. Tarrant's reply was, Bugger that, I want the world record. By mile 70, Tarrant had nearly caught up to Box. Box could hear the labored breathing of Tarrant behind. Suddenly, the two men were no longer in a marathon. They were in a sprint. Box surged forward, desperate to hold off Tarrant's charge. He said, I hated being overtaken. I couldn't stand it. Tarrant's crew screamed at him to slow down. The two exchanged the lead back and forth. For lap after lap, the gap between them opened and closed as each tried to outsprint and crush the other. The only two other runners left on the track were Corbett and Bentley. Box held the lead for several miles, but by mile 75, he cracked completely. Tarrant pushed ahead. Corbett also experienced exhaustion around that point, but he knew he couldn't quit. Like Box, he had traveled too far to be taking the easy way out. Somehow Bentley made a full recovery and was the fastest on the track, but an hour behind. This was no longer a sport or something that could be stopped. This was a life and death fight for survival. Each man's battle to finish depended on whether he could control his mind to keep fighting. It was an agonizing, monotonous slog. Corbett struggled with terrible, painful ah. spy chafing until an official's wife found him some petroleum jelly. With just a few laps to go, the crowd began to chatter and swell. Abandoned flasks and plastic beakers littered the trackside. Every one of the runners who staggered out of the race had stayed behind to see what would happen. Without exception, they were bellowing and clapping Tarrant toward victory. Tarrant crossed the finish line in 12 hours, 31 minutes, 10 seconds, a new world record by 15 minutes. He battled to stay on his feet as the crowd roared. He told reporters, I'm a shade tired. Box finished next about 30 minutes later. His crew chewed him out. He knew he shouldn't have done those sprints with Tarrant. With five miles to go, Corbett wasn't sure he could make it. The lap seemed to be so long, he thought, I've got to finish before something happens. I must keep going. He finished his 100 miles in 13 hours, 33 minutes, and 6 seconds, a new American record crushing the old mark by three and a half hours. At the finish, Corbett was offered beer and sandwiches. He replied that what he really needed was a new pair of legs. The race killed Corbett a little. He thought his running days were finished. It took him four months to find enthusiasm for a long training run. Box was so sore that the day after he had to walk upstairs backwards. 
Eight hours after the finish, Tarrant was on a plane bound for South Africa to go back to his dock worker job and his quest to win comrades. He had obtained a 300 pound loan from his employer to make the trip. He explained, I won't finish paying for it until March 1971. If you are keen enough to do something, you will always find a way. I have committed myself up to the hilt for the next year and a half, but it was worth it. Stay tuned for more 100 mile history. With that, this is Davy Crockett, and this is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I hope you run fast and far, enjoy life, get outdoors, and most of all, stay safe and don't take unnecessary chances. <laughs>